this time on The Gadget Show. Jason and I are set a challenge to design and build a gadget that will appeal to not just humans, but another species of tech lover altogether. Jason! Yes, prepare yourselves for a cat fight, a dog-eat-dog -dog confrontation, as we find out who can create the most innovative and ingenious wow. gadget for pets. Oh. Hey. Also, John guides you through the best online photo printing services available. And Otis heads into the woods with ex-Special Forces hardman Mike Hawk to test the best pocket tools you can buy. The hardman. Welcome to The Gadget Show. Now, this week's challenge, aside from being quite a testing one for both Susie and I, uh, for me, I think it's fair to say it was a bit dangerous. Dangerous? No, I'm not messing with you. Are you having a laugh? I'm not having a laugh. Why is it dangerous? I'm talking about allergies, people, all right? So all what right, are you allergic tank. to, then? Seriously? Yeah. <laughs> Pollen. Um, grass, like normal lawn grass. Is this going to be a long list? Dust, sort of masonry dust. Tree pollen, builders that charge too much. Dogs, cats, horses, gerbils, ferrets, cigarette smoke. Smoke like forest fires. I hate them. I always run away from them. Okay, yeah. Um, roll the film. Yeah. Is yeah TV it? presenters with with like little hair like that, and little hook noses, and go. Ah! Oh, I'm really allergic to them. I'm allergic to that. Roll the film. To begin our challenge, Jason and I had been sent to the leafy surroundings of Middlesex University to await our instructions. Is it just me or is there a dog just walked up and sat there? This dog here with the jacket on and the envelope on his back. It says Jason and Susie on it. I'll just remove that. Thank Thanks, you. little fella. Nice jacket. Here we are. Jason and Susie, your challenge is to each build an innovative pet gadget. Ah, OK. Uh, you have to choose different pets for your build and your gadgets will be judged in a month's time. The loser will have to suffer an animal-based forfeit. You'll find help at Middlesex University. Good luck. Pet gadgets. Really? That's a great idea. I like it. I love pets. I, uh, well, you're allergic to yeah, animals. I'm allergic to more animals with hair. Oh, dear. Fish gadgets. <laughs> It didn't take much research to discover that the world of pet gadgets is booming. It seems there's no end to the number of techie toys you can find for our four-legged, feathered and fishy friends. There's even a bespoke airline for pets in the States to transport beloved animals in style. However, our experiences on the gadget show have taught us that gadgets and pets don't always go together. <laughs> But with nearly half of the UK households home to a pet of some sort, it's a massive market to tap into. We just needed to find the right ideas and the right pets to build for. I think I've made my choice. I know what pet I'm going to go with. Uh, there are seven million of them in homes in the UK. I am, of course, talking about the sloth. Now, I'm talking about dogs. I'm going with dogs, OK? You know. Here, boy. Fetch! Oh, I'm really sorry. Well, there's no contest for me. It has to be cat. I've got my own cat called Ginge, and Ginge would never forgive me if I didn't choose cats. I've always had cats. I love cats. In fact, I think I'd like to come back as a cat. And if I can make one furry little feline with little sweet ears and a little pink nose, if I can make their life better, just one of them, then I know I've done my job. And anyway, I can't stand the smell of dog pee. So we decided to do a bit of hands-on market research, which meant a whole load of moggies and a dozen or so woofers, and a selection of dog and cat gadgets to try out. Oh. Owners ready? Yeah. Good. Dogs ready? <laughs> I'd found lots of canine toys and gadgets from the Sublime. It's basically an office water cooler for dogs. Brilliant. To the ridiculous. <laughs> Ruby. <laughs> Ruby. To see if I could get some inspiration. Not an easy task, given that meat and animal hair really don't mix. Brilliant fun dogs, aren't they? However, they could easily be replaced with hypoallergenic robots. Fred, you've completely ripped the zombie to pieces! I had all sorts of toys, robot mice and cat flaps to try out. If only I could get my cats to play ball. I can't believe it. I've got gadgets everywhere. I've got remote control mice. I've got little balls and things that hang on things. They just don't seem to be very interested. The only one that's interested in the technology and the gadgets is the bald one. Jason! In the name of research, we continue to cajole our reluctant group of testers to try out all sorts of gadget ideas, from laser toys for cats to exercise devices for dogs. 
That's the hardest dog owning mark, is it really? Yep, the Dog Jogger Treadmill gives you an all-weather solution to get your pet as fit as, well, a butcher's dog. Our explorations even extended to the little cat's room. Don't get me wrong, I love my cat, but I honestly don't think it's been hard done to with the fact that it hasn't been able to go in a flushing toilet. Don't believe it. He's actually using it. This is fantastic. The Cat Genie is an automatic cat toilet that, once plumbed into your cold water supply, cleans, washes and drains your cat's business away. Yeah, it's a cat toilet that flushes. Finally, after some hard testing, we'd found some tech to kick-start our gadget build ideas. Now, this is a gadget that I think could be really genuinely useful. It's a tracking device that's used to find your keys, but you could find your errant moggy. All you have to do is put a little homing device on the collar here. There you go. There you go. Off you go. And then, when you've lost your cat, you just press the button on your locator. The lights illuminate when I point it in the right direction and the sensor beeps like that. And I know that my moggy's over there. <laughs> so I was starting to think about some kind of cat tracking device. Oh, whilst I'd found my inspiration with a ball thrower. It's just a piece of plastic that launches a ball and it seems to me, out of a lot of things that we've seen, that one of the stalwarts of dog fun is just chasing after a ball. It's a, it's a brilliant, brilliant device, but there's definitely room for improvement. So, after a fair bit of meowing and a lot of slobber, we were ready to start on our own pet gadgets. <laughs> Oi! Oh. Your dogs loved your gadgets. Oh, they were brilliant. This dog jogger, I think, is great because I can have my dog on it and I can play my video games. Genius. Genius idea. A bit lazy on your part, I think. Yeah, but nothing new there. All right, so we've both chosen which pet gadgets we were going to make. Yeah, we just now uh, had to build them, so I'm getting a little bit out of breath, uh, and find an audience for them, which, of course, will be made up of dogs or cats. Yes, but stick around because there's some great tech in this challenge and I'm not just saying this, yeah. it is one of the funniest it's challenges hilarious. that we have ever taken part in. Whew. All right, time for a short break now. Can not for you. Come on. Can we? Oh, all right. After the break, John sifts through the online photo printing services available to see which one is the best. And Otis teams up with a very muscly man who leads him into the woods to play with pocket tools. <laughs> Welcome back. Now, I want to talk to you about online photo printing, or more specifically, which of the myriad of different online photo printing services out there is the very best? Well, to find out, I've been engaged in some serious testing. Digital cameras and photo software have made the whole process of taking pictures and getting prints so much easier. Take a photo, load it onto your computer and print it out. What could be more convenient? Except that printing at home, especially if you've got a whole batch to do, can be quite a time-consuming process. And there are the ever-present threats of running out of ink, head clogs and paper jams. <clears throat> However, digital photography also means that there's a brilliantly convenient and easy way of getting your pictures printed properly by professionals. And that's online. It couldn't be simpler. Register your details, upload your photo, then sit back and wait for your pictures to pop through your door in a couple of days' time. But there's a huge number of online printers to choose from. So, which one's the best? To find out, I spent an hour or so last week taking snaps around Birmingham before loading them onto my computer. They were a typical mix of people and views. Some taken with flash, some without. And I'd even up the saturation on one to see how the printers coped with over-the-top colours. Then I sent them off to 13 of the country's leading online photo printers. Their prices for a 6x4 photo vary from 5p to an eye-watering 73 pence per print. And their delivery charges vary quite a bit too, from 99p to £2.95 per order. Out of our 13 contenders, nine arrived back within five working days, which we thought was long enough to wait, so we discounted the rest. So, in the world of online printing, do you get what you pay for? Are the more expensive prints better? I had a good look at the prints I'd got back. The first thing I noticed was a wide variation in colour and contrast. 
and immediately, actually, one of them falls by the wayside. This set here from Colorama has to go. They're just too washed out. The difference between their canal print and the one from Tesco below it was obvious. The Tesco print was just so much richer, and that bleached out look was carried through all Colorama's prints. Next to go are this set from Kodak. They're just too contrasty. You lose details in the highlights there. That building's completely disappeared, whereas the shadows are very dark. I mean, the greens turn practically black here. I'm also not happy with this set from Jessops or this quite similar set from Aldi. The colours just look a bit peculiar, frankly. Our chap here looks distinctly green round the gills, whereas uh, the chap in the market just looks uh, rather overexposed and a bit pallid, so uh, they have to go. So that left us with photo box at 10p a print and £1.49 for postage, Tesco, which was more expensive at 15p a print, Snapfish, which cost just 9p a print and 99p for postage, plus the pricier Peak Imaging, who charged 67p a print, and One Vision, who charged 73p as well as £2.95 for postage. Between the last five, it's much harder to judge. I think you'd be pretty happy with all of them. One, though, is best. I think One Vision has pictures that are of superb quality. You could spend hours slaving away over a printer at home and not get better results than that. But they are expensive. They're 73p each. And I think for our overall winner, we've got to look somewhere for better value. Um, and uh, best overall is Snapfish. Excellent colours, good contrast and lots of detail for just 9p a print. Make Snapfish the gadget show's all-round online photo printer of choice. Snapfish. Absolutely brilliant. And I was really surprised by the difference in pricing. It's just extraordinary. I was surprised that some of the big hitters, the big names, didn't get better results, weren't you? Yeah, it's useful to know, though, isn't it? Yeah. And still on the subject of photography, Sue, I've got a great gadget for you. Okay. All right, you're going to love this. Mm. It's called the Gigapan. Right. right. This is the Gigapan Epic. They make various models, but essentially it's a housing, a device that, that you fit a compact camera into. I'll just get it started, OK? And it starts to take a 360-degree panorama at gigapixel definition, OK? So you don't have to stand there no. and take loads of pictures and then try and stick them all together. Well, no, I'll show you what I'm talking yeah, about. Yeah, let's have a look. Here's one that I did earlier at the studio. I made sure that no-one was in it when I took the shots. Um, first of all, I can zoom in really easily. I can scroll through the studio. In fact, we can show you the... Oh, this is the messy bit the, around the here. backstage area, yeah. yeah. Like. What's the clarity like well, if you zoom in, this is a good question, Sue, because that's what's most impressive about the Gigapan. Uh, the name comes from the fact it's a gigapixel image. If I zoom into the Guinness World Records, yep. you can really easily read the writing. And what's interesting about the image that we're looking at now is this isn't saved locally on a computer in the studio. It's actually up on the internet, and so that anyone can look at it. Um, if you've got a rental apartment or, or something like that, it's a great way of showing people around it. Yeah, if you were selling your house, it'd be perfect, wouldn't it? Yeah. Really good idea. Right, now, before we move on, I need to tell you that this is your last chance to vote for the Gadget Show Gadget of the Decade. Yeah, it really has been an extraordinary ten years for gadgets, but now we need your help to help us decide which are the best. Here's how you vote. Go to our website at 5.tv slash gadget show and follow the Gadget of the Decade link. You'll find five categories to vote in. The best phone gadget, best entertainment gadget, best photographic gadget, best music gadget and best computer gadget. Read through the nominations, make your decision and then click on the blue vote button next to your choice. Then go to the main category where you can choose the overall Gadget Show Gadget of the Decade from all the nominations. And remember, voting closes on the 9th of November. Right, now it's time for the Wall of Fame. Each week on the Wall of Fame, we choose two iconic gadgets from a particular category. And then pick one of them to join our growing ranks of gadget royalty that has already made it onto our celebrated wall. And this week, it's a battle of phones. It's the iPhone versus the brick. 1983 was a huge year for tech, with the launch of Microsoft Windows and Nintendo's first games console. But the biggest of all was this. The iconic Motorola Dynatac 8000X. The first true mobile phone. There's a new headline, there's a new it took Motorola 10 years and £100 million to develop, but it became an immediate hit with the rich city boys and girls riding the crest of the early 80s boom. 
But let's face it, they were the only ones that could afford it. When the Dynatac launched in the States, it cost $3,995. And for that, you got 739 grams of phone. That's the equivalent of carrying 74 iPod shuffles around in your pocket. The battery gave you just 60 minutes of talk time before it required a 10-hour recharge. But in the 80s, it was a revolution. There was a waiting list of thousands to get one, and in 1984, just a year after launch, there were 300,000 users worldwide. This is the Adam and Eve of mobile phones. From this handset came every other handset that we've talked, argued, texted, surfed and flirted on. And you know what? I think it's quite cool. Go on, John. It'll look lovely on the wall of fame. Dino what? Dinosaur, perhaps? Look, there is only one truly iconic phone on the planet, and it's this, the gorgeous Apple iPhone. It was born of the iPod family in January 2007, yet was sexier than any iPod, and on top of that was a full-on multimedia phone with push email and a truly groundbreaking touchscreen interface. Apple had taken the mobile phone to a whole new level and completely reinvented it. The iPhone was and is revolutionary. The user experience is sumptuous. It's tactile, glorious. The design and the build quality, I don't think you can find in any other phone. The iPhone finally hit UK stores in November 2007. You had to shell out £269 for the phone and then sign up to a £55 per month contract. But despite the cost, hundreds, including me, queued outside stores to get their hands on this mobile marvel. <sighs> over half a million were shifted in the first weekend, and to date, over 21 million iPhones have sold worldwide. The iPhone is a near-perfect gadget. It's what we all want, a combination of style and content. The iPhone is chic, it's glamorous, and it's bursting with functionality. I absolutely love this gadget. Come on, Johnny boy, put it on the wall. Absolutely fascinating. Two really iconic gadgets. As ever, there are a couple of questions. Susie, the brick. How can we possibly put something on the wall of fame whose main claim to fame is that it's simply grotesquely large? <gasps> That's not its main claim to fame. Its main claim is that it's the first truly portable mobile phone that made phone calls. Hmm, good point. The iPhone, Jason. I love the iPhone, but does it actually do anything that a gadget didn't do before? I don't, it's an interesting question. I mean, in terms of hardware and software, uh, perhaps the technology's already existed, but you can't forget about the design of this oh, thing. Yeah. It is so desirable, much like Susie's phone. When it phone. comes to design, look at that. Hey, there's no comparison. This is a really tricky decision. I mean, they are true icons, both of them. But if I have made a decision, and it is the brick. <gasps> because Yay! I used both of these when they came out. I was really impressed by the iPhone. But I can also remember the sheer thrill of being able to use a telephone anywhere you wanted for the first time. And for that reason, it has to have its place on the Wall of Fame. <gasps> Right, time for another short break now, but after that... Susie and I crack on with building our spectacular gadgets for pets. Woo-hoo-hoo-hoo! <laughs> and Otis gets all rufty tufty in a wood, testing the top five pocket tools with the super hard Mike Hawk. <laughs> back now it's time for this week's top five think about this pocket tools are the mechanical equivalent of a smartphone they're compact multifunctional and potential lifesavers if you find yourself in trouble miles from anywhere but which is best well to find out Otis puffed up his pecs and headed off into the woods for a meeting with a very tough man and a lot of mechanical origami I'd got 30 of the best pocket tools on the market, and who better to help me test them and select the Gadget Show's top five pocket tools than ex-Special Forces survival expert, Mike Hawke. So, Mike, multi-tools, what are we looking for? Well, the main thing is that it can do all the essential tasks yep. and do them well. So, what will be our first test? 
I would say rapid deployment is critical for life saving, so how quickly we can open them. So we're just gonna unfold stuff? Sounds simple. Not so simple when your hands are all cold and numb. Oh, yeah, I can imagine that would be quite difficult. Yeah. Ain't no imagining. The test was simple. With our hands suitably chilled, <laughs> we had just 15 seconds to locate and open up three concealed tools on each gadget. While one of us was working, the other had to keep his hands in the ice bucket. My hands are freezing cold. OK, straight to this one. Three, done. You qualify. That's three. That'll stay. Oh. It soon became apparent which pocket tools were the easiest to operate with our frozen digits. Yeah, that's three. Oh. <laughs> and which were virtually impossible. How does that work? So that's got to go. Oh. That's out. Right. Not even a multi-tool that one blade. We're feeling it. OK. Eventually, we were able to eliminate all the tools that proved too fiddly or had too few blades. Are oh, you just showing off now? Oh, 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 yeah, 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 that little thing. Yeah, OK, <laughs> he stays. We're done. That hurt, man. <laughs> a lot. Yeah. <laughs> now, we've whittled 30 down to 17. What is test two? A good M tool has to be able to tighten, grip and open things for you. So test number two is going to be to conduct an essential survival task of cooking. Right. We had to use our remaining multi-tools to screw together a barbecue, then open a can of beans. Good, strong pliers. I yep. like that. No pliers. Check that little bad boy out. A screwdriver's real nice. Negatory on the pliers. It's out of here. This is cool, this little ratchet action. Just pull it right out. That stays. OK, this won't even turn it. You're out of here. Every now and then, I'd come across something interesting. Oh, Mike, look, this is for getting stones out of horses' hooves. Never needed that in Iraq. The final part of test two involved breaking into the beans. You are kind of playing around there. Be <laughs> <laughs> yeah. my guess, OK, please. just got to keep on going a nice little flow. There we go. I see that. This one is a go. Last one, the Leatherman Charge. Let's see. OK, that gets 100%. This whittled it down to seven remaining pocket tools. It was time for our final test. <sighs> One thing a multi-tool should be able to do better than anything else is cut. This is a climbing rope. And because lives literally hang by its threads, it's built to withstand brutal treatment without shredding or splitting. But every once in a while, one of these has to be cut in order to save a life. So, for our final test, Mike would be against the clock, using each blade to cut me free as quickly as possible. I expected this to take a while, so what happened next came as a bit of a surprise. Cutting now. Oh! That was like butter. That just sliced it right off. In fact, all the seven remaining tools sliced through the rope in seconds, but two were a fraction slower. Conveniently, this left us with our top five. In fifth place, the Victorinox Swiss Champ XAVT. I like Swiss because it's got everything. In fourth place, the Buck Extract impressed us with its strong blade and clever retractable tools. In third place was the Gerber Suspension Multiplier. I like the Gerber because it's got good spring action. In second place, the Leatherman Charge offered a great range of functions and rugged build quality. And at number one, the SOG Power Lock came out on top due to its super sharp blade, ease of use and comprehensive choice of tools. And there it is. Here it is. And I've got to say, the crew, after that piece, were absolutely raving about this. And that means a lot, <laughs> doesn't Susan, it? you're right. It means something because cameramen always have multi-tools. Have you got a multi-tool right now? Let's test the theory. Tom, have you got one in your pocket? I bet he has. <laughs> yes! <Yay! laughs> Hold on a minute. Yeah, that, you see? Brilliant. That's not a multi-tool. Right. This. Right. Is a multi-tool. Oh. No. Is the ultimate. Now it's That's ridiculous. It's made by Wenger and it has 85 different tools on it. Yes, you would have to have an awfully large pocket, wouldn't you, <laughs> for that? But if you want a really useful multi-tool, then you might want to enter this week's competition because we are giving away the entire top five pocket tools. Yes, but that's only the tip of this week's Gadget Show competition, Iceberg, because we're also going to throw in 15 of our favourite top fives from this year. And that doesn't even reach the waterline of this iceberg of a competition, because if you win, you'll be joining us next year, Easter next year, at the NEC 
Forget it so live! Okay, but that's not all. Because in this week's competition prize fund, we have 120 gadgets for you to win. Here comes the list. As well as all our top five pocket tools, you could also win our top five dab radios, our top five home security gadgets, our top five sports watches. Our top five headphones, our top five RC flying toys, our top five scooters, our top five toys, our top five digital photo frames. Our top five flasks, our top five April Fool's gadgets, our top five juices, our top five kites, and our top five lights. Our top five USB gadgets and all our top five travel speakers, a Panasonic digital camera, a 50-inch plasma TV, a 32-inch LCD TV, a Blu-ray player and five Blu-ray movies, a MacBook laptop, a Canon printer, a Wii, a Wii Fit, a DSi, an Xbox 360, a PS3, a PSP Go, a Parrot gaming chair and games for all the consoles, a swap watch, an iPod Touch, an Arcos 5, a Flip Video Ultra HD, a Rovio mobile webcam, a bulletproof USB memory stick and an Oral-B electric toothbrush, a Slingbox Pro, a Gorilla Pod, a Berghaus Bioflex rucksack, a Magimix food processor, a Yogi Gatekeeper Pico and a Griffin Bluetooth headset, a Pocket Surfer, a Flat Light and a Dyson Ball vacuum cleaner. All that plus four tickets to Gadget Show Live at the NEC in Birmingham next Easter. And a limo to take you all the way from your front door to the show and back again. It's a prize fund worth nearly 18 grand. And to be with the chance of winning the lot, you'll need to know the answer to this question. Which comedian starred as Ace Ventura Pet Detective? Was it A, Steve Martin, B, Robin Williams, or C, Jim Carrey? To enter, call 0904 161655, or text A, B, or C to 63555, or send your answer name and contact telephone number on the back of a postcard or sealed envelope to Gadget Show 14, PO Box 46556, London N1, 0WW. Calls cost £1.50 from a BT landline. Calls from other networks may vary and from mobiles will cost considerably more. Text cost £1.50 plus one message at standard network rate. For rules, go to 5.tv slash win. Lines close at midday on Monday the 9th of November and two days later for postal entries. Of course, we'll show you the question again at the end of the show. Good luck. Now it's time to return to this week's challenge where Jason and I had to build a pet gadget. Yes, I plumped for dogs. So those of you who love dogs, dog owners, maybe even dogs, right now, sitting on the carpet watching with your owners, you'll know <laughs> what I'm talking about when I say that dogs love to run after things. So that's what I decided to do, a sort of uh, device that would enable a dog to run after a ball and retrieve it. Yes, I was going to exploit that unique side of their personality. OK, whereas I am all about the cats. I love cats. I've grown up with cats. I've got a cat. And, in fact, if I didn't choose cats, my cat, Ginge, would never speak to me again. Your, your cat can't talk, Susie. Cats cannot talk, all right? They can poop in a basket. They can jump onto an infeasibly high wall, but they can't talk. OK, there's a cat on YouTube that says hello. <sighs> Isn't that really? Yes, there really is. OK. <laughs> Having already spent hours bonding with our chosen animals and researching the gadgets they like, we were at Middlesex University to put our own gadget ideas into production. I reckon I know what I'm going to do. It's an automated ball throwing and retrieval device. All right, so you can put it in a space like this or in your back garden. While you sit down, the device is going to throw the ball for your dog. Your dog's going to get it, bring it back, put it back in the device, and the device will throw it again. And it can even then randomise the process so the ball never goes in the same direction twice. Genius. And I'd been thinking about a gadget for those independent moggies. When they disappear through that cat flap, who wouldn't want to know where they've been and what they've been up to? I certainly would. And that's why I'm going to devise a gadget that tracks the cat and hopefully offers video feed as well. <laughs> We'd both be getting help from the university's Department of Product Design and I was busy scheming with designers Wynn and Tom. The, the device fires it, the dog grabs it, runs back here and puts the ball back in the scoop and thus automates the entire ball-throwing scenario. Would you want to add anything in, give some more interactivity? We can give it encouragement, we can give it a treat. Yeah, I think that's a great idea. Basically, this is doable. That's what you're saying. Yep. Awesome! <laughs> Suitably inspired, we moved on to some prototypes for the launch mechanism. <laughs> <laughs> we needed to get a big launch but from a small device, and we eventually settled on a circular design. Yeah. We were then able to start prototyping the rest of the elements required for a fully automated system, a directional launcher, treat dispenser, and a ball collection device. Genius, boys. But the real challenge would be getting all these elements to work together in one machine. Meanwhile, I was getting some advice from product designer Andy on my cat-tracking video device. 
I wanted to harness the type of GPS tech I'd seen in mobile tracking devices before, such as the CAT tracking unit, but make it small enough to fit on an actual cat. You can get something like this now, though. This has got a GPS chip in it, and it's also got a GSM module, so it will work over the phone network. And what you do is you can phone this module up, and then it will text back the GPS co coordinates to you. So no matter where your cat is, you'll get a GPS fix on it. That was actually quite light, isn't it? And it's not just GPS units that are getting smaller. You can get a small wireless camera that's about that big, yeah. again, pretty light, which we can encase and house under the cat's chin. So, so is that it, then? Job done? Just something like that together? If only it was that simple. Yeah, I had the key bits of hardware, but the challenge would be combining them to produce one usable device. And to do that, we began to create a basic web application. This would display the video feed and convert the GPS coordinates received via mobile phone into an easy-to-read map. We're pretty much there. Got those last, last few lines of code to crack. A week later, and my boar launcher had gone from wooden prototype to a CAD-designed robotic monster. Dogbot was born. Hey, how you doing? Nice to see you, nice see you again. My God, it's incredible. <laughs> With its launch mechanism and automated platform to randomise the direction of throw, my contraption may have looked a bit eccentric, but the tech was the mud's nuts. <laughs> I love it. To avoid hitting dogs in the face, we also put in an infrared proximity sensor. As soon as something's quite close, it will stop the program so that it's safe for the dogs. And its intelligence is all controlled with a small computer and a fidget, a USB device that allows you to control mechanics using simple visual programming. We've even added in voice recordings to bring the machine to life. Good boy. Good boy. Fetch. <laughs> And next door, I was in the lab getting ready to test CatCam. The web app was up and running, communicating via text with the GPS unit and displaying the video feed from the camera, both of which had been housed with moulded plastic and attached to a standard cat harness. All I needed now was a willing test pilot. Although it has to be said, Archie didn't look overjoyed with his new toy. There you go. Let's see where he goes. Alex, the cat! Is it working? There it is, going now. Ah hey! The tech worked, showing us Archie's brief exploration of the department on camera and on our map, even though after a while he decided to sulk in the corridor, refusing to budge. While Susie dealt with a moody moggy, I was getting ready to try out my prototype ball launcher and hoping for more success with my tester. <laughs> Hello, she's Molly. She's the best of the dogs that we've seen at running after balls. She's born to run after balls. Wait. But how would she react to my crazy looking prototype launcher? Fetch. Go on, Molly. It's brilliant. Yay, here we go to the ball. Off you go. It needed a few tweaks. Oh. And some training for Molly. Almost. You see, she's getting there. But basically, it worked. Fetch. Deck chair, feet up with your flip flops. Molly runs around all day. It's the perfect scenario, isn't it? Oh, Brilliant. I love this. Oh, good. Some really good ideas, but it's quite big, isn't it? It's a little on the large you side. You know, can you imagine? I'm just going to take the dog for a walk. Uh, over to the park. Checking, you're checking the mic. Why? It's a prototype, it's a proof of concept. I know. What about you? What? And your poor cat, the reason he sat, what was his name? Archie. The reason Archie sat. So exhausted and forlorn in the middle of that corridor was because that thing's so heavy, it was muscle fatigue. Poor cat couldn't move. He was like... <laughs> <gasps> he did have a little walk around. This is a it prototype did. as well. It worked really well as well. Anyway, after the break, our gadgets are going to be judged by professionals. And right here in the studio, there will be a winner and a loser. And whoever loses will apparently have to face an animal-based forfeit. I can't wait for that bit. Why? Well, I don't know. It's just exotic, isn't it? The no, you might sense be. of jeopardy. What about if you have to eat a bowl of cat food or something? Well, or lick a, lick a mouse. Do you want us after the break? Lick a mouse? Yeah, you might have to snog a dog. <laughs> I can think of all... I, honestly, snogged a few I dogs. I think <laughs> of forfeits. <laughs>Hopefully you'll remember that in this week's challenge, Jason and I had to come up with and make an innovative pet gadget. This is mine. Huh? <laughs> an automated doggy ball throwing and retrieval device. OK, you're a dog, for example, OK? I'm you not. Drop, clearly not. You drop a ball in there, ball is shot randomly into park or garden, doggy goes and grabs ball, brings it back, drops it in, treat is dispensed. 
It's genius. It's absolutely genius. Love the treat dispenser. Thank right, you. this is mine. Cat cam. Uh, GPS device, so you can always know where your cat is at all times. And a little camera here, so you get real-time pictures sent live from the cat collar. Two brilliant ideas, I'm sure you'll agree. But only one of them can win this week's challenge. And for that, we had one final test to face. And also, for the loser, in an unprecedented move for the gadget show, an animal-based forfeit. Yeah, and it is that word forfeit that's making me feel well a little sheepish. I thought it might be the word nanimal, which I actually just said. Anyway, run VT. As a man with a pet allergy, I was heading for my final test, feeling more than a little apprehensive. I was at Puppy Farm Awareness Day in Brighton, which meant a whole load of hairy dogs and me. Oh, and my dog book. I would have to demonstrate it in front of a dog-loving audience and convince my judge for the day, vet Mark Abraham, how great it was. I was really hoping it would work, ideally, before I went into anaphylactic shock. Is there some jobs here, just in case? <laughs> Molly, you ready, baby? OK. Although Molly had been given training with the dog bot, if I was going to have a chance of victory, it was crucial that she could use it independently. Yes! She put it in the bowl! It's fired! She's got it! She's bringing it back! She's definitely going to put it in the bowl. I just know, in the bowl! In the bowl, Molly! In the bowl! In... Oh. Well, almost. Meanwhile, I was heading to a rather more sedate setting, to the home of TV vet Scott Miller, to try to convince him and his cat Ricketts that my cat cam tracker could improve their lives. Wow! This is the prototype. Oh, look, he's, he's already he looking think? a bit like, what's that? Well, I think it could be fantastic. If it actually works, then uh, certainly as far as uh, animals being lost in the UK, about a quarter of a million every year, um, I think their owners would be happy to know there's a GPS system in place. All right, then, do you want to try it out? Let's give it a go. OK. <laughs> So I set up my laptop, mobile phone and wireless antenna and prepared for my big moment, finding out if Ricketts would actually wear the device. Do you hear him? Always looking impressed. <laughs> there we are. He's purring away. Shall we let him go and see where he goes? Yeah, sure. There you go, buddy. However, our chilled out cat oh, didn't quite look in the mood for a GPS testing adventure. Oh, Rex, come on. Oh. oh. Um. <laughs> <laughs> Back in Brighton, I was having more success as Dogbot was getting a lot of attention from the glamorous clientele and their owners. Guys, come here, go! Yay! And so far, it was going down well, even if my dog wrangling skills showed no signs of improvement. Sonny, Sonny, give me the ball! Give me the ball, Sonny! Give me the ball! Oh, look, Amber! Would you, would you just run, run after the ball, Amber? Now I faced a nervous wait for my slot in the show ring. With Ricketts not appearing best pleased with my cat cam tracker... <laughs> Here we go again. We tried a longer harness to see if there was a problem with the fit. Right, mark two. Mm. Ricketts? Mm. Come on, Ricketts. What do you think he's thinking at the moment? He's, he's bemused. Ricketts may not have been doing much, but at least now I could demonstrate the tech. So, if we just click on this gadget show icon here, you're going to see a paw. Here we go. Ah, paw prints. There we go. So, Ricketts is in your back garden. Ah, handy, considering I can actually see him <laughs> in the back garden. <laughs> well, our gadged up pussycat did now seem ready to capture some exciting footage on camera. Oh, look. Oh, he's thinking about... Hang, hang on, he's, he's moving. He's, oh, he's back in. Oh, he's going to do it. Come on. Oh, look oh. at that. <laughs> Ricketts. There's no live feed. Um... OK. My plan is not quite working. No. No. <laughs> Meanwhile, it was time for mine and Molly's final reckoning in front of an audience of dog lovers and my judge, vet and doggy expert, Mark Abraham. This was it. I've made an automatic ball-throwing and retrieval machine, which I've called Dogbot. But Molly wasn't quite following the script. Leave it no, Molly. Put it in the bowl. Leave it. Leave. 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 <laughs> Molly. Molly, that was my hand. But as I kept up the spiel, she dropped the ball just right. Which throws out a treat every three throws. At least it should be well done, Molly. Molly did that all on her own. Did you see that? And she's got a treat. Did you notice she picked up a treat there? Wait, wait, wait. Go, Molly! Go, Molly! So 
success! It worked! The audience, both doggy and human, seemed extremely impressed. But how about my judge? <laughs> so, Mark, yeah. Dogbot? Yes. What do you think? I think it's quite cheeky. I think it, there is a place for it, for maybe disabled people or, or the elderly. And I think that would be the best reason to get a dog bot, uh, is to exercise when you physically can't do it yourself. It's fair to say my test hadn't quite gone to plan. We didn't need the GPS to tell us Ricketts was in next door's garden and was refusing to come back. And he'd lost the battery pack for the camera. When he did finally return, I braced myself for Scott's verdict. I think the idea is great. I think it has applications for finding cats that are lost, and that's at the crux of it, which I think is great. Um, unfortunately, though, this is one of the coolest cats in Britain, and the fact that he was uncomfortable with it means that most would be uncomfortable with it. So, certainly some design changes. Yeah. So, I don't even ask you at the moment, you wouldn't <laughs> buy anything like this for your cat? No. No. Um, no. <laughs> that was great. Wasn't it brilliant? Excellent. Now, but as we made quite clear from the start, whereas one of you will soon be celebrating another glorious oh. gadget challenge victory, oh. the loser will have to face an animal-based forfeit. <laughs> the loser has to wear this delightful shell suit. Oh, Isn't it lovely? that's Beautiful. hideous. But in what I think is actually a delightfully traditional forfeit, they're also going to have to have these two ferrets down their trousers. <laughs> this is Jessica and the ferrets, called Starsky and Sunny. Hi, Jessica. Oh, nice Jess. ferrets. Yeah, mm. thanks for bringing your ferrets in. Do you normally just wander around with two ferrets? Cool. So, we asked your judges, the vets, to score each pet gadget they were testing out of ten. And Jason, Mark Abram, gave your dog bot eight out of ten. Well done. That is impressive. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> and Susie, Scott Miller gave your cat cam five out of ten. <laughs> Meaning you get to wear the lovely shell suit <laughs> and experience Starsky and Sunny at close hand. Oh, I think it's worse actually wearing the shell suit, quite frankly. Great, look. It's very fetching. I'm Rob's. loving it. OK, Jessica, you've got no. the ferrets ready. Oh, you've got the ferrets ready. Let's just pop them in the top there. I think down the trousers. All right, would be let's better. go down the trousers. Yes, 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 yes. We're not looking. All right, we're just putting the ferrets in. Jessica, you you put the little ferrets in there. That's Starsky going in. How's that feel, Suze? Well, <laughs> not does it feel like anything? Okay. okay. Uh, in goes um, Sunshine. In you go, Sunshine. Oh. Sunny. Drop it. Sunny. I'm Sunny. so sorry. Get it right, Sunny. Hang on. Do you think? Do they know where to go? <laughs> How, how do they know where to go? <laughs> Jessica, how do they know where to go? Look, look oh. at this one! <laughs> this one that, that way. Ooh, no. <laughs> no. <laughs> Don't sit on it. Night, oh. yeah. No, let's not say goodnight. Let's keep this rolling, OK? Good. They can pause flash forward for a few minutes. <laughs> look at that! <laughs> look! All right, that one's stuck. Um, mm. I think it's about time that we said yes. uh, goodbye. We'll bye see bye. you next time. Next time on The Gadget Show. Hey. Otis and I join forces to build a dragster. A dragster powered entirely by power tools. It's a monster! It's a monster! I'll be taking you through the Gadget Show's top five useful websites that you've probably never heard of. Genius. And John gives advice on how to get the best out of customer service phone lines. I'm transferring you to someone on our team to help. That's next time. But right now, before the credits roll, remember to enter this week's incredible competition. We're giving away four tickets to next year's Gadget Show Live exhibition at the NEC in Birmingham and a chauffeur-driven limo to take you to and from the show. And on top of that, we're throwing in enough tech to fill any tech lover's home. To be in with a chance of winning the lot, you'll need to know the answer to this question. Which comedian starred as Ace Ventura Pet Detective? Was it A, Steve Martin, B, Robin Williams, or C, Jim Carrey? To enter, call 0904 1616 or text A, B or C to 6355. Or send your answer, name and contact telephone number on the back of a postcard or sealed envelope to Gadget Show 14, P.O. Box 46556, London N10 WW. Calls cost £1.50 from a BT landline. Calls from other networks may vary and from mobiles will cost considerably more. Text cost £1.50 plus one message at standard network rate. For rules, go to 5.tv slash win. Lines close at midday on Monday the 9th of November and two days later for postal votes. Goodbye and good luck.